Good morning. It's good to see so many of you with us. Um, we have a few missing because it is uh, summer camp week, so a number of our members are up in Prescott this morning. Let's be praying for them and their safe return and for our youth of the congregation. We're going to be at camp all week. be praying for them as well, um, that it will be a good edifying week for them and that they will have safe returns back. Uh, it is the first Sunday of a new quarter, and I just want to say thank you for the teachers who volunteered um, for this quarter. Um, we're here for you. <laughs> Uh, and we want to say thank you for those who have uh, taught the last quarter as well. And I'm, I will always make this plug. You will be our deacon's friend, and you'll be just the favorite teacher ever of our deacons if you want to decide to volunteer for next quarter or the quarter after that, any quarter really. Uh, they always need somebody to volunteer for that. And uh, if you're not sure about that, maybe you want us to get started, well, now's the quarter to sit and shadow one of our teachers and see how it's done. But that will tell you. Once you get over the first bite, it doesn't hurt after that. The kids are really nice. I'm just, no, it's okay. It, it, it's fine. It's a, it's a really good experience. If you want to do that, it'd be an edifying experience. And you'll find out that I think I learn a lot more teaching than I did just sitting and listening. And it's because you have to think about how to explain this to your appropriate age group. And it's, it's a good thing. So I'm going to be making my... Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 3. I hope you'll join me there. 1 Timothy chapter 3 this morning. And from our scripture reading, we want to focus in on the last part of the first verse of 1 Timothy, Timothy chapter 3, where it reads as follows. It is a trustworthy saying, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a good work. And this is not going to be a lesson on the qualifications or the character traits or per se, all about the work of elders, but focusing on that last phrase, as the title implies, a good work. As I wrote the Bolton article, it seems that there's some jobs that just get a bad rap. And I think eldering is one of them. I have known brethren who whole several generations of men in certain families have refused the office though they might be godly qualified men simply because of the perceived ills that come with the office or one man had a bad time with it and i think perhaps paul might be addressing i don't know for sure but he might be addressing similar misconceptions but he reminds though reminds timothy and by extension reminding those who Timothy preaches to, that if a man aspires, it's his aim, he, he thinks he might be good at it, at the office of, of being a bishop or an elder overseer, all interchangeable words in the New Testament, that fundamentally it is a good work. He doesn't say a hard work, he doesn't say a awful work, he says a good work. And there's much good that is, comes from this office of shepherding. It oftentimes goes unrecognized. It's often work that goes undervalued. But it is a good work. And so this morning we want to look on things related to that. And, and beginning with just very quickly, just the man himself, when it comes to this office. Again, as we said, he, he is desiring a good work. And I think just talking to men and meetings and so forth, I think this point gets forgotten. I think this point gets overlooked. Because oftentimes when we think of the work of eldering, we think, of, oh no, I have to do, I have to be the guy who administers discipline. Or I have to be the one that deals with the sticky doctrinal question. Or I have to have the whiteboard meeting where we're trying to untangle somebody's mess and help them get it back together. And that's a, that's a tendency with all humans. We tend to focus on the negative to the neglect of the positive. No congregation of the Lord's people is scripturally organized until they have elders and deacons. It should be a little bit uncomfortable if they do not have spiritual leadership guiding them. That's what God wanted. And for that fact alone, it is a good work because it is what, how God designed it. 
But make no mistake, it is a work. Just very briefly, let's just look at some of the things that shepherds are, are called upon to do. You know, back in Acts, the 20th chapter, when Paul's getting ready to lead Ephesus, we read in verse 28, him warning there that the shepherds there at Ephesus to be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Let's continue reading. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will rise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be watchful, remembering that night and day after a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish you with tears. And now I command you uh, to God, uh, uh, commend you to God in the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you inheritance among all those who have been sanctified. Last charge he gives these elders. They have to be watchful. They have to be on guard. That's inherent in the position of shepherd. What do they have to be on guard against or for? First and foremost, that they themselves do not drift away from the faith. But secondly, for the congregation in which the Holy Spirit has appointed them overseers. Because Paul knows that they are going to become, come into the congregation from without and within the leadership, those who did not keep watch after themselves, and began to drift, began to go into error, began to tolerate sin. That's a full-time job. If you look in First Timothy, uh, First Peter, excuse me, chapter five, verses one through four. It, it takes work in order to fulfill this uh, command here of those who would have spiritual leadership. In first four verses of 1 Peter chapter 5, it reads, Therefore, I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, overseeing not under compulsion, but willingly, according to the will of God, and not for dishonest gain, but with eagerness. Yet, not as lording it over the, the, those allotted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. Shepherding requires humility and a watchful eye, as we see here in this text. It must be done so willingly. It cannot be done for the, for the goal of getting something in return. He says not for dishonest gain. And it has to be done with gentleness, not as lording it over the flock. And that, all that means is simply a man who was unqualified to begin with, and it goes to his head and thinks he's something, and to borrow the words of the Apostle Paul, to think he's something when he's not. Um, it takes a godly man to do this work of overseeing and watching over and caring for the souls of those allowed to his charge. Part of this work involves a lot of teaching. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, and towards the end of that verse, the text does say he must be able to teach. And I'm not here to tell you this means an auditorium class, because it doesn't mean an auditorium class, because they didn't have those in the first century. But I will tell you what it did mean in the first century. My position as located evangelist was a rarity. Philip preached for 30 years thereabout at Caesarea Philippi, but the teachers, week in and week out of a local congregation, were its shepherds. Now, what we're doing is not unbiblical. It's a biblical model. Um, and I'm not saying that because it's self-serving. I'm trying to protect my job. Uh, but in the first century, you saw elders were very, very active in the public teaching. In the 21st century, we see this work carried out a lot with one-on-one. -on -one, in small groups and phone calls and encouragement and just, just talking with the flock here and outside of the building. It's a full-time job, and a, and a man must have the ability to adequately and convincingly communicate the Word of God. I think it's interesting, we're going to read from John a little bit later in the general epistles of John, but John and Peter, both of the apostles that we have record of, served as elders. 
Peter says, I exhort you elders as your fellow elder, and John refers to himself as the elder. So when we read the Gospel of John here, the, the last chapter, the, there's a principle I want us to look at, and I think sums up the work of shepherding. In John 21, in verse 17, during the, the love discourse that Jesus has with John, he's, Jesus said to him a third time, verse 17, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Excuse me, Peter. I got it confused there. Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said earlier in verse 16, shepherd my sheep. He said in 15, tend my lambs. Now we read in 1 Peter chapter 5, he was a fellow elder. I wonder how many times this conversation went through Peter's mind in the years he served as an elder, of Jesus giving direct charge to him, take care of, watch over, feed my people. And that principle there applies, really sums up the work of shepherding, is the care and nurturing of souls and the protection thereof. And so a man, as we read this morning in verses 2 through 7, I'll just reference you back there since that was our scripture reading, a man need have his house in order. It's a full-time job. He needs the care and support of a wife. He needs to have the experience of having raised children. He needs to be of good, godly character. But as we read earlier this morning, he sets the example for the flock. He is to be engaged in teaching. And he has to have a character that is above reproach. Uh, that's what the New King James, King James says, blameless. Does not mean sinless perfection. It means above accusation. He's a man who, as we would say in the common vernacular, house, has his house in order. And so if he has his house in order, he is therefore qualified to help keep God's house in order, as it were. And I have verse 11 up there because verse 11 applies both to the wives of deacons and elders, that they too are to be of godly character. But as we've seen recently, there's any number of examples I could point to in the Bible of what happens when you are mismatched in a marriage of believing and unbelieving, or godly character, ungodly character. It does not end well. I cite to you Samson and Delilah, David and his first wife, who despise David's worship of God, um, there's replicate uh, examples of that. But I want to focus just real quick, and this the last slide might be reviewed for most of us, but what is the good in shepherding? Because there are days, having not been a shepherd, but I can imagine there are days, and some of you will be nodding your head because you have served in this role, where you ask that question. What good am I doing? Where's the fruit? They're long days. They're tiresome days. They're, they're heavy days. So where's the good? I think f first and foremost, it's, there's good in knowing that it's God's work is being done. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, the Hebrew Christians are admonished in verse 17 here to obey their leaders and submit to them. For they, that is their leaders, keep watch over their souls as those who will give an account, so that they will do this with joy and not with groaning, for this would be unprofitable for you. As we saw in Acts 20, shepherd the flock of God, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Shepherd the flock of God among you, 1 Peter chapter 5, and here Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. Sometimes what we need to know, or men who serve that role need to know, is that at the end of the day, even on the hard days, that God's work was done. And that can be very powerful and encouraging when you've had to have the hard conversation, when you've had to call out sin, when you've had to discipline somebody who is uh, unruly or contentious or divisive or when somebody has fallen away. But there's, maybe that's just a 
a point to get you through the hard times, but there's also the joy that comes from seeing those who have labored with, um, excuse me, I'm skipping ahead of my outline. There's also joy and the, the, there's good in knowing that the la- your labors will oftentimes outlive you. In fact, more often than not, they will outlive you. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter, excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Peter writes here, he says, Therefore I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been strengthened in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right, as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has indicated to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. This is the first congregation I've been at where there is actually a history of solid, godly leadership. Congregation I grew up in, it's kind of like the eldership existed in, in, in spasms. They would have it for two years and something would happen, they would go 20 years without it. They would have it for three years and go 20 years without it or something. It wasn't consistent. Here, since 1953, there has been a consistent, stable eldership in place. And why am I bringing this up? Because we've, we have real-life examples of what Peter's talking about here. Many of you older men have mentioned the names to me of Hayden Pyatt, uh, Harry and Charlie Mann, uh, C.W., uh, Orville Hinkle, all those men have served. And some of you serve because of those men's good example and influence and mentoring. That their labors as shepherds have long outlived them because they were diligent to do God's work. And so there's a godly legacy there of their labors. Thirdly, there's joy in seeing that those you taught are walking in the truth. These are the verses I was thinking of earlier when I misquoted uh, Peter as John. But if you look in 3 John, right there next to Revelation, just before Jude, we see in verse 1, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. We quote that because here's an elder talking here. And he says in verse 4, that he says, I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children are walking in the truth. My mentor, Mark Dunnigan, has served as an elder at one point in his life. And one of the great joys that he had was when he heard that somebody he had taught the gospel was appointed as a shepherd several years ago. But when this man walked into the building, and these are his words, he was an angry young man that had a lot of questions and was wanting to just pick apart the Bible. Mark gently answered all the questions with Scripture. The man was baptized, and and Mark, over these years, God's grace has seen this man grow and continue to grow and continue to go from this angry young man to having the godly character that made him fit for the office of overseer. Now, I think parents in the room can understand, perhaps, the joy that comes from seeing your adult children do you proud living good lives, you know, being industrious and faithful and having good relationships, making good, wise choices. It's the same thing with spiritual, uh, familiar relationships, if you will. To see those who you taught the gospel grow into maturity to where they are now engaging the same work that you are engaging in. I know of a congregation in Oregon. Al Craig was one of the big names, if you want to say it that way, in Oregon. He had preached for 40 years at Market Street. And at one point, the eldership in which he served, there was four of them. The other three elders, Al had taught their high school Bible class. And now they were serving with him. That was a very unique and humbling and and joyful experience because this man got to see this fruit come to fruition. 
get to see those he's worked with walking in the truth. Fourthly, as we read in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, there is the assurance, there is the promised reward that those who have engaged diligently in the work of shepherding, when they meet the chief shepherd, Jesus, they will receive their reward for their stewardship of God's sheep, of God's people. Now, I've been speaking mainly to shepherds here this morning. There are some things that we need to think about as the good in us having shepherds. First and foremost is that we have spiritual protection. We read in Acts 20, 28 through 30, but Paul prophesied, he saw that after Paul's departure, they would come ravenous wolves, not sparing the flock, seeking to pull some of the sheep away. And so what are the shepherds supposed to do? They are to be on guard for themselves and for the flock, so that might be mitigated. And if we look in the book of Titus, when Titus records, when Paul records the character traits of elders in the, in the epistle to Titus, we see this character trait tied to how a man must know the word of God adequately uh, versus, excuse me, verse 9 of Titus 1, that the man who is going to be an elder must hold fast the faithful word which is in accordance with sound doctrine, so that he will be able to exhort in sound doctrine and to reprove those who contradict. There's a lot of spiritual threats in the world. A lot of so-called would-be teachers. A lot of individuals who want to sneak in and, and introduce strange teachings to lead, us, uh, lead away the people of God. And a shepherd, first and foremost, when the flock is out grazing, using the earthly example, he's not dilly-dallying around. He's keeping a watchful eye on the horizon. What's, uh, what's coming up? What's, is there any threats coming our way? But as a shepherd's crook, it's a sign of comfort for the sheep, but it's a sign of pain for the wolves who would dare take the sheep. And a shepherd has to do both. And for us, we should be very thankful that we have godly leadership to fulfill this role. Secondly, we receive spiritual care. We receive spiritual care, as we read in Hebrews 13 and verse 17, that we should submit to our leaders because they keep watch over our souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with bitterness or, or complaining, for this would be unprofitable, not for them, but for us. I have known men, not here, but I have known men who have stepped down from the office of shepherding because the congregation was not heeding Hebrews 13, verse 17. And it weighed on this man that says, how can I fulfill what God, told, has, God has given me to do when I'm up at night until no end worrying about the spiritual condition of the flock and they will not respond to any guidance or whatsoever? He said, I'm going to be held account, account to that. And because of a congregation's disobedience, this man stepped down. Now the eldership continued, but imagine if there was only two men. Congregation went and lost leadership. Now the normal caveat goes, I, I, I reckon that if they're ungodly or, or being a diatrophies or whatever, yes, the Bible does not require us to do this, but we all know that. But the spiritual care we receive is invaluable when we have these men in positions of leadership. As we read in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17, I, again, I can't, I wonder how many times this came through Peter's mind. On the hard days, on the good days of Jesus telling him, tend my lambs, feed my sheep, shepherd my flock. And there is much comfort and peace that comes on behalf of us, at least I have comfort and peace, when I know that there are godly men who the Holy Spirit has appointed over us to keep watch over my souls, to keep an eye on the horizon for the threats, so I can just focus on what I need to do as a Christian. Because I tell you what, when the congregation doesn't have elders, and you have men's meetings, been there, 
That's a whole other level of stress if you do it right, in my opinion. Because then the work of shepherding falls to whoever's going to step up. And I'm not saying fill the role, but decisions have to be made. And I get very uncomfortable in those situations because I can't read about that in the Bible. But we can't be ignorant or willfully ignorant of potential threats or issues that need to be taken care of. And thirdly, we have godly leadership. We have protection, we're cared for, and leaders that are worthy of following. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 13, again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 13. But we ask of you, brothers, that you know those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, that you regard them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Congregation's default position when it comes to its leaders, as Paul says here, should be we should know them, not just they're the leaders, but we should know them as persons because they're first and foremost our brethren. And we should love them because of the labor in which they are doing on behalf of us. Because they are bearing the burden of leadership. Because they are dealing with the threats. And I will tell you this. It is a mark of good leadership that most of us, myself included, do not know everything our shepherds are doing. We don't need to. We don't need to know how many threats to the flock they have taken care of, of how many souls they've admonished or encouraged, of of what they're doing, because if if they're doing the work right, a congregation is at peace. Threats are dealt with swiftly and justly. And souls receive the care as needed, when needed. And so, in the spirit of 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 13, I did a little research, digging through the congregational history and directories as far back as I could find them. Maybe that's one good thing of us, of in general, not throwing away anything. You, you can do that. Uh, but in total, this flock here, I think is, is more important than any preacher we've had fill this pulpit, any man we've had out for meetings. We've had 21 godly men serve in the office of shepherd. Some for only a year, some for a long time, some for a short time. In the past, and I know that's small, but their men, the first eldership was A.C. Hahn, Sid Kochler, and R.O. Edwards. I don't know who any of those are. Most of you don't. I, I don't think any of you do. Maybe Jim. Um, but that was the first eldership. And getting an eldership established is sometimes the hardest first step. But once it's established, you just keep adding to it. From there was Charlie Mann, James Cashin, L.B. Clayton. Um, L.B. did the mural, by the way, in the baptistry. And is Michelle Malone's dad. Harry Mann, Hayden Pyatt, Leo Austin. Ferris Pensal, Orville Hinkle, um, Raymond Hardin, C.W., Russ's father, Thad. And more recently, we had Russ and Ronnie, Mark Beans, Jim McNurray, Maurice Baker. The current eldership is Brett and Kurt. I bring this up not because it's, we're trying to pat each other on the back here, but to recognize that a big reason why we at 10th and Country Club have survived 70 years as a congregation. That we have a reputation for preaching truth and being engaged in the work of service, of fulfilling Ephesians 4. It's because we have had spiritual leaders who have led the way these 66 years that we've had leadership. My math's wrong on that. Anyway, these 60 plus years we've had leadership. And some of these men, like I said, have served a year, maybe two. Some of these men served 41 years. 
And so I go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13 as we bring it to a close this morning. But we ask of you, brothers, that you know those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and, and admonish you and that you regard them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. It is a good work, and it is good that we have men to fulfill that role and do the work, both present and past. And so, if you take any, anything away from this lesson, maybe today, maybe you had a thought of appreciation for the elders, express that, past and present. And maybe all of us this week need to, and going forward, just continue to pray for our shepherds. That God would continue to give them many years in, their, in his service. That they would be granted all wisdom and insight necessary to shepherd this flock of God. But as considering what we've been through the last three years, five years for that matter, I don't know where we have been had we had not godly men at the helm to chart the course. And you know, we read from 1 Peter 5 this morning. It says that when they have done their job, that they will meet the chief shepherd who will reward them on that day. Well, that day is the day Christ returns. And long before these men became shepherds, long before some of them even served as deacons, they all made the same choice that every single person has to make in their lifetime at some point. What am I going to do with Jesus who is called the Christ? Every one of these men, the believers here, have made that choice. And if you're here this morning, you haven't made that choice, you're, you're not sure what I'm talking about, is, well, Jesus claims to be your Savior. That God has given testimony that he is the promised Christ of the Old Testament, the, the one who takes away the sins of the world. And he, he died for you and me on the cross. So you and I could escape the penalty of death that is due us due to our rebellion and sin. If you believe that, you're ready to confess that and unite yourself with Christ in the waters of baptism, we'd be happy to help you with that this morning. Maybe you're struggling and you need prayers of encouragement or there's sin in your life that needs to be dealt with. We invite you to come as Sarah Sanders sing the song that's been selected. <laughs>